Thank you, Bill. Everybody hear me all right? Yeah, good. Again, John Weir, and I'm from Oklahoma State University in the Natural Resource Ecology and Management Department. And uh, we've been working with prescribed fire there at OSU for, for several years. And we've always had this issue about how do we get more fire on the land? Because, you know, that, that's, that's the main issue, is how to get more fire on the ground and get to do it. And the other thing is that we've got to remember is, is that fire is not a tool. Fire is part of the ecosystem. It falls in line right behind rainfall. Because without rainfall, we have no fuel to burn. And without no fire, we have no prairies, we have no grasslands, and we have no healthy forests whatsoever. And so we are right now, throughout all of the United States, we are in the middle of the biggest fire drought you have ever seen. Because we're in a drought of fire. We've got to have more of it on the ground. And so how do you get it there, and how can we do that? And so what we've been working on is some stuff with some burn association. But what I want to share with you is, again, thinking back and looking back at, at how much fire is actually was on the ground at one time. This map was drawn in 1888 by a gentleman coming through. And these areas right in here <coughs> that he shows these dark colors, he, sh he showed these areas, and let's look specifically here in Oklahoma and Texas. Those darker orange areas, he said that over 10% of that area was burned annually. So there was that much fire in through there. Other areas a little less, but look at what the deal is, is look how much fire occurred throughout the U.S. Lots of fire. And this isn't lightning fire. This is Native American fire. Man is the keeper of fire. Man is the only, only species of animal, which I don't know, can really consider myself, an, I am an animal, but I'm not an animal, that uses fire. Other animal species utilize fire. They utilize the benefits from it but we're the only ones that go out and set it. And we're, it's important for us. So this is 1888. Let's look at, at 2012 from Rich Guyette and them. This is what they come up and surmised from theirs. And there's a couple other papers and different ones that you can look at that show how much fire was really on the ground at those times in those areas. But the key of it is, Look at this area right here, Oklahoma and Texas. Again, the southern Great Plains. About every two to three years, that country burns. How long has it been since it's burned? It's been a long time. And we're reaping the benefits of that, aren't we? Through a lot of different things. But again, what this shows, and again, you know, we can sit and argue that oh, it's not two years, it's four. Okay, I don't... I don't care, but what it's showing is there's a lot more fire out there, or there needs to be more fire out there than there is, is what it's showing. And so again, why do we need fire? And you know, why, why are the benefits of it? Well, biggest thing is, these are most of our prairies in the southern Great Plains throughout the central part of it, being encroached by, by cedar, by juniper species, or other woody plants, and they're gone. Well, why are those there? because of lack of fire and fire suppression. And we're losing it. What about this big issue right here? Wildfire impacts on homes and people and, and property. Big part of that. Another big thing, allergies. You know, human health, let's talk about that. How can, how can human health benefit from fire? You see that right there? That's not smoke from a fire, that's pollen from cedars. And you get to see the good cedar count, heavy mold count. Everybody's allergies, starting, in a, starting here in about a month. Here in the southern Texas and Oklahoma, you're going to have allergies from December till March. Because you've got ash juniper or blueberry juniper going to start pollinating here pretty quick. You've got eastern red cedar fixing to start pollinating. And it's going to be fun. And so again, you know, just look at it just in the short term. So here's some comparison, just some quick comparison maps. This is northwest Oklahoma up around Woodward. So again, 1995, we're starting to, you know, you see the cedar encroachment coming in there. 
But 2012, that same area, same view, real short. Still water up north central Oklahoma. You see more opening here again. It's getting invaded, getting encroached. It don't take long for it once it gets started. And then the biggest thing that I like to see is this, and this is a property that borders our research station west of Stillwater, and I've kept an eye on this for a long time. Because people go out, oh, we'll go out and clip it, or we'll, we'll apply herbicide and we'll do that. Well, one thing is, there's nothing that we can do, chemical or, or mechanical, that mimics what fire can do to the land, for one thing. But the second thing is, you've got to have fire. If you're going to use those, you still have to have fire to maintain those. So this area right here was clipped in about 1994, right before this Aero 95 photography. And you can see how open this little area is. Here's that same area, no fire. They went in mechanically and clipped all the cedars. You know, 15 years, 17 years later, it's worse than it was to begin with. And so again, how do we manage that? How can we do that? So again, and the question is, how do we get more, more fire on the ground, especially throughout the, the Great Plains region of, this, of the country, and especially when we're talking about private lands? You know, the Forest Service and all the government agencies, they talk about prescribed fire, but if you look at how much they do and how much gets burned, they don't get nothing burned. They can't manage their own lands, let alone think about managing private lands, really. You know, especially when you live in, in Oklahoma and Texas, where you've got over 95% of both states are private ownership. You know, so how do we do that? Well, bur prescribed burn associations are what we can do. And I'm not going to go into great detail of what's going on, because Larry Joe's going to talk more about burn associations and stuff. I'll just give you a real quick deal. That's where we got a group of landowners together in an area, and they pool their resources, and they help each other out, and they help each other burn. Because again, they're private landowners helping each other manage their own lands. And that's what it's all about, is getting that on the ground and getting that, getting that done. <clears throat> so in 2012, we did a survey <clears throat> of, at that time, there was 54 known burn associations in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska, and one in Colorado. And I got 27 of them to reply back to our survey. And we were asking a bunch of different questions, trying to get a good understanding of where we were at, where they're going, and what they're able to get done in doing that. And so one of the, one of the questions was asking, what, what are the goals and objectives? Why are you out there burning? Because that's, that's a big key. Why do you want to burn? Here's the greatest interest. Biggest majority of all the burns for always, this is so. So again, their their answers were always, occasionally, never. You know, that's the three big, always, out there to kill cedar, and prevent cedar. But the the biggest, the, the most interesting thing is, over the years, livestock production and wildlife management are going hand in hand. As always. Not a whole lot of difference between them, but look at this wildlife occasionally. Land ownership's changing, changing, land thoughts are changing about things. Wildlife's taking a big precedence over that. So again, fire and wildlife. And also that, that comes to change a lot of the stuff we do, because a lot of our prescriptions and a lot of reasons we burn at certain seasons of the year and all that is all about livestock production. And so we can start changing up some of those things, getting more fire on the ground by changing that. But again, goals and objectives are important of why they're doing it. But that cedar, woody plant encroachment, is the key of why we're doing that. So I also ask them again the question of how many burns were conducted and stuff. And so during that period from the oldest burn association that I had on there was 1995. So in a 17-year period, they'd conducted almost 1,100 burns during that period. This was 27 burn associations responding back. Uh, one of them had actually responded back, and they had just formed, so they, they hadn't burned anything. They hadn't got to do anything yet. So, but that's what they were doing. That's kind of spread out by, by what state had done what and doing that. 
the, the big key is, is how many acres have they done? And during that period, they'd burned almost a half million acres. And that's good. I mean, that's, that's a good start. We need more. You know, that's not, not near enough. But that's a good start. And again, you know, people think about a lot of acres that gets burned, and we think about, we hear about wildfires and about acres burned and things like that. And I can give you stuff from Oklahoma, and even people in Oklahoma are surprised. You know, on average, we might burn by wildfires in Oklahoma 50,000 acres a year on average. You know, some years are a lot more, some years are less, but we're not getting huge amounts. Do you know how many acres in Oklahoma are intentionally burned every year? One to two million acres. You never hear about it. One to two million acres a year intentionally burned, and you're not, you know, you don't hear anything about it. So again, these burn associations are getting started, they're taking off and they're doing things. And the things that, that, you can, that comes into it, into play, is people talking about, well, how well can they do it and how good can they do it? And that was one of our big questions was, let's talk about escapes and let's talk about spot fires. Because that's, that's everybody's biggest fear of using fire is the fear of liability. And I'll tell you this, that, that fear is founded on fear itself. And that's a whole other talk. We can talk for hours about that. But, I'll t but again, this stuff here shows exactly what I'm talking about, how fire is not that fearful animal that everybody thinks it is. So again, so you think about it, 1,100 burns. I asked a question to them, did you have any spot fires that occurred on your burns? And a spot fire was def defined as any fire that left the burn unit, no matter what the cause of it, but they were able to suppress with the equipment and people on site. And if you burn any at all, you're going to have spot fires. That's just, that's part of the deal. But being able to recognize them, understand when they're going to happen, keep them at a minimum, that's, that's the big deal. 224 burns out of 1,100. 21 percent. One out of five. One out of five burns that's conducted, there's going to be a spot. We're going to go put it out. And that's the same number that I found working with experienced crews over time, same kind of numbers. And I've looked at some other numbers from federal crews, they have the same rate, just as well. So it's, it's the same thing. It was kind of like asking the question in here, how many of y'all have never had a car accident? Probably not very, very few. Why do you drive cars? You've had accidents, haven't you? Should be scared of it. But again, then the next thing is, is escapes. Escape fires are the ones that everybody really fears because they're the ones that are escape. So that's a fire that they left the burn unit no matter what the cause, but you had to call for assistance to get somebody to help you put it out. Call the local fire department or whoever. 16 out of 1,100 burns. One and a half percent. Not much. And all those burns, acre-wise, I think the total acre estimated on those 16 escape fires was 500 acres total. It's nothing. The kicker is, you know how many lawsuits were from those escape fires and spot fires? Zero. Do you know how many insurance claims were filed? Zero. It's not there. That kind of stuff, that fear of liability is not there. And again, as the burn associations, as people working together as a group, they're managing all that risk and taking a lot of that away by being able to do that. And the big kicker is, of those 1,100 burns, 75% of them had volatile fuels involved, cedar trees on site that are volatile fuels capable of putting fire brands and embers across the fire line very easily. And that's their record. Very good. We also asked them in that survey to rank some needs. We, li we listed six needs that we, that we knew that, that they had. <clears throat> and we wanted them. And they were training, insurance, membership, equipment, funding, and new laws. Again, what were the needs for these burn associations to keep operating? Number one come out as training. 
And you can see by state, it's pretty much dead heat within all those states within that. Insurance was number two over here. And it was a very interesting point on insurance is Oklahoma and Texas ranked it a whole lot higher, or excuse me, Kansas and Nebraska ranked it a whole lot less than Oklahoma and Texas did as a need. Two different, different cultures, different ideals within that. Membership, you know, getting more people to help out, more members. Equipment funding were down lower. Why would that be? One reason is all the burn associations that we surveyed had received some type of grants for equipment. So equipment wasn't a lot of their need. They need people and they need training to get things done. And that's what we find out. We're equipping them and we're funding them, but we're not giving them an adequate enough training. We need to get more training, get more fire on the ground, and help them get more fire on the ground and, and try to get that done. Interesting enough, new laws was number six, all the way on the bottom of the list, by far. They were all able to burn within whatever they had to do, within that. And so, you know, you think about the burn associations, they have very much local impact and local preference, but also a lot of these things go to a national or regional scale and can continue to grow and become bigger. You know, just think at, you know, management of fire dependent or values, You're thinking about social values, economic values, and things like that. Again, trying to introduce fire back into a culture that has no fire and trying to build that back up on that. You got to start at a local level and work your way on up. You know, same way, legislative insurance on laws. We can start at the local level. A lot of the burn associations are able to burn, in Texas, Oklahoma, are able to burn when there's a burn ban enacted within their county because they're a member of that burn association. So they've had local influence with law. But then now we're going to work at state levels, national levels, about making fire more friendly and getting fire-friendly laws that we can use. And again, that cultural change or adaptive capacity that we have is doing that. So again, not only are these working both ways, coming from the local on up, but also we're trying to work from the top down and to get things going with things that we can do. Currently, right now in Oklahoma, we have 21 burn associations throughout our state. that we're doing. I would like to say that all of them are active and go-getters and doing all that, but they're not. And so, Several years ago, we kept trying to come up, how do we get, how do we get them guys up and going? Because again, because we got, you know, about half of them are, they are active, they're, they're doing stuff. And the other half are kind of so-so. How do we keep the ones active and how do we keep the other ones not? You know, how do we get them going? So in 2011, we formed the Oklahoma Prescribed Burn Association. And uh, we involved a lot of the key conservation groups within the state, our Conservation Commission, our Wildlife Department, Oklahoma State University. Um, Nature Conservancy, the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation, a lot of the key conservation groups in our state to form that. And our goals for, for OPBA was again to, to work with the existing burn associations to see what their needs were so that we can get more fire on the ground and to form it, it, you know, existing ones. And actually at that time there's 21 burn associations now. When we formed that in 2011 there was only 13. And so we've actually added eight more in the last three years or four years that's going on. Again, work on funding, not only for OPBA, but also for the burn associations. Work with finding equipment, training, getting more of that on the ground. And also, again, one of the key, ask, key questions was about finding group insurance for that. It's something that's a standalone policy. It's hard to find. And what have we done since then? Well, you know, OPBA became a 501c3 with also with, with an IRS affiliation agreement. So what that means is all the burn associations in the state of Oklahoma can become an affiliate member of OPBA and use our 501c3 status for whatever they need. So if they need that 501c3 benefit, they can use ours within that. We also got a statewide radio frequency and a grant that bought a lot of radios that we're passing out, getting them to the radio, getting them to the burn associations for them to use. 
we've been able to get uh, fire equipment through grants and donations and stuff. Burn trailers, we put out, uh, I think we've got nine burn, tra burn trailers that we've put out in the last four years. Uh, in enclosed cargo trailers with a lot of hand tools and things like that, as you can see on those pictures there. And doing that, again, funding through a lot of grants to help paying for training, different things. And then also we've provided an online and a hands-on type training policy that we can have and to get more things out there with it. We've also got a website that's up, ok-pba.org is our website. It's, we're hoping it to be a clearinghouse for information for people burning. We've got links for weather, links for fire plans, links for laws, all, all the kind of stuff that we can get. Uh, probably one of our biggest things that we have on there is a prescribed burn entry form. It's where we want people to come in and got about a 20 question form we have people fill out after they burn just to let us know what they burned, how much they burned, if they had any escape fires, any kind of stuff, keeping a record of what's going on, how many acres we're trying to get burned. And that's not limited just to Oklahoma. We've got it opened up to everybody. So we're trying to be the, the, main, the main focus for everybody to do that. Again, we've become an advocate for the burn associations and partnering with groups like that. We were able this year, as of last January, we worked with an insurance company. We got a standalone insurance policy that's available for anybody that wants to burn. It's a standalone li uh, prescribed fire liability insurance policy. And it's all, not only good in Oklahoma, but it's good in all 50 states. You, can, you don't have to be, live in Oklahoma to get it and do that. We've also been able to hire, in a, on a part-time basis, three regional coordinators. Uh, to go out and work with the PBAs in those areas to help them write fire plans, help provide training, help them along with burns, because these guys that we've hired, the coordinators have a lot of burn experiences, so they're going out and assisting with burns, showing them what they need to do, how to do it, so we can get more fire on the ground in doing that. Then if you look at it as a region, what's going on in a region-wide setting is you look at Texas, Texas has a prescribed burn alliance of Texas. Again, which Larry Joe's going to talk about here in just a little bit. Statewide association formed up. Kansas in the last year has formed up. The Kansas Prescribed Burn Association, which again, they're working with their burn associations in that state. Nebraska has formed the Nebraska Prescribed Fire Council, which again, they're, they're just at the ground stages of it. But again, they're seeing the need of it with their burn associations and getting things done on that. So it's actually a regional type deal. Uh, in 2012, we kind of formed the Alliance of Prescribed Burn Associations, uh, mainly with people from Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, and Nebraska, working with a lot of those regional issues of what's going on. Again, there's no need to reinvent the wheel about burn associations. A lot of them in Oklahoma and Texas have already been through everything, all the formation processes. Here's, here's the problems we've run into. We don't want you to run into the same things. So we're trying to get that information out. And again, we've actually got burn associations started in Illinois and Mississippi. I'm currently working with South Carolina and North Carolina right now. I think we're going to have one big burn association in North Carolina start up right after the first of the year. So again, getting, it's catching on. It's catching fire everywhere. So that's going to be a big thing. And I think, yeah, again, it started all right in here in the Southern Great Plains and things that we can do. You know, and we're looking to expand that and what we can do. So, leave you with one thought from my buddy, Al. You know, Al was, a, Al was a pretty good nuclear physicist, but in, that was just a hobby. His real love was prescribed fire. <laughs> As you could tell, he developed some pretty nifty ignition devices in his time. And, and I, unfortunately, I, I wish I'd been able to, was old enough to be in his class, but I wasn't. But again, he stated that fire is a tool used by brave men and women to make a better world. And it is. A little fire goes a long way. We can make a lot of stuff better. With that, and we've got to remember that. The good, good people always use that. And also we've got to remember that a good prairie fire prevents a forest. I always remember that. Prairie fires prevent forests. 
And so, with that, if I have any questions, I'd be glad to to entertain them. John, I, I had a question for you. Yes, sir. You made a comment about uh, that return interval where it was showing a two to three year return interval on a lot of this yep. grassland. Mm -hmm. How much is needed to? Yeah. Well, you know, you, you do some some simple math. I did some math for Oklahoma, just looking at Oklahoma yeah. at one time. So Oklahoma covers about 45, 46 million acres is what we have. And if you look at it, about half of those acres are, are, burnt, are flammable acres. So they, those are rangelands, shrublands, and our forests that we have. The rest of it's crop lands, water, you know, stuff that won't burn. But about that, about, about half of that, about 25, 20 to 25 million acres of it is flammable lands that need to be burned. And so if you think about that, just, just go on a, on a conservative four-year fire return interval. That means we need to burn a little over five million acres a year to get, to get caught up. You know, currently we burn, like I said, a million to two million acres every year in the state of Oklahoma. Unfortunately, probably a million of that is the same acres every year up in the lower extension of the Flint Hills and the Osage Hills and stuff there in northeast Oklahoma. You know, I mean, it's, I'm glad it gets burned because it, need, it, it needs it, but unfortunately this, those same acres are, are a big chunk of that acreage. But we've got, we've got to get more. So, but you, so you think about that, five million acres a year, that's just in Oklahoma. You know, you could do the same for Texas, you know. Larry Joe, what'd you say, 178 million? I, I think it's 171 million acres in Texas. So I'm sure it's probably about the same as Oklahoma, about half of that's probably flammable lands as for the most part, you know, that'd be easy math, you know. So you figure out, man, that's, that's a lot of fire. You know, are people, is people ready for that? That's, that's what we got to get them ready for, it is seeing that much fire on the ground. Because that's what it did, historically. Any other questions for, for John? Yes, sir. What time of year do you, what, is it, all of those burns, are they there are various times of the year? Kind of, kind of what's my burn season? Uh, you know, you know, we have traditional burn. You know, a lot of times you have to see those traditional burn seasons, especially the Flint Hills and the Osage Hills of Oklahoma. Those ranchers and stuff in Kansas and Oklahoma, you know, they have that traditional burn season of, of March, you know, February, March, April, and that's that's again, that's a big time of it. But again, we're trying to to change that up so we can get more because again, that limits your amount of time that you can burn. So right now, what I recommend for most people is let's let's look at start burning January one. Because that's when I start. I start burning around January 1, and then I end sometime around midnight, December 31st. <laughs> so every day is a good day to burn. And that's the way we need to look at it. Because historically, fire occurred every day of the year in time. Those places burned. Again, a lot of it goes with what your goals and objectives are. You know, so, if, so if you're a rancher and you're wanting to overwinter cattle on some dry grass, you wouldn't go out in October and burn everything off. But if I'm, if I'm wanting to burn prairies that are running into cross timber sites and stuff, I, that's a good time. To, November, December is a good time to burn because you got leaf fall and the leaves are fluffy. They haven't compacted down. That's a good time of year to burn. You also read a lot of historical accounts of Native Americans, and they burned a lot in the fall. It's kind of interesting. A lot of fire in the fall. We've been doing a lot of growing season burns, burning throughout May, June, July, August, September. Great responses uh, with that. Also getting a lot of good response from the landowners. I'm getting a lot of our burn associations are doing a lot more growing season burns. They're seeing the benefits of it. Again, a longer burn season, able to get more burns done. Also burning in the growing season during that time, it's a whole lot safer, it's a whole lot easier. It may be hot, it's hot, you know, it's 90 to 110 out there, but that fire's 
not going anywhere fast because there's so much green. There's enough green vegetation, it slows ignition down. Yes? I won't say. The fire act differently. <laughs> it gets treated differently a lot of times. But no, fire is the same no matter where it's at. So. I'll share that point. <laughs> All right. Any other questions for John? I, I think, you know, that the, the, the whole focus of this, this session on restoration was to really identify the lack of fire, which is an essential component of a prairie ecosystem. Without fire, Without, you don't have a prairie. A prairie doesn't exist. It can't exist. You have a forest. You have a forest. And and not only do you need fire for that for that uh, fuel reduction and safety factor, but you need the fire to promote a healthy grassland system. Yep. And if you don't have it, you're you're on life support. That's right. So, yes, sir. One thing I'm concerned about is uh, the Forest Service has been using more and more April uh, growing season burns like into April. Uh -huh. And one of my concerns is that are they eliminating certain species? Because if you're burning in the growing season, there are a lot of things like a lot of orchids, their, their foliage is already out uh -huh. and you destroy it. What do you, you know, what effects do you have? You know, you know my, my, thoughts are, my thoughts are on this is, is I, I, I my number one is get fire on the ground. That's number one. Then let's worry about other stuff as it, as it pops up. It's kind of, kind of like a hay meadow. There's always certain species that get, because if you cut hay off the same place for 80 years, you're going to do it. So if you do the same thing to the same place every time, so if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got, because you're doing the same thing over and over again. And with fire, I think we, can do, we, will, we would do the same thing. So you would not want to burn the entire place every April, every year, yeah. over a long period of time. Let's change it up. And that's, and that's the thing. But the first, thing we've, first step we've got to overcome is we just got to burn it. That's number one. Then number two, we can start worrying about details of is April better or should we burn it in February or we should burn it. Then also the other thing you think about is how big an area are you burning and what kind of impacts are you having? You know, if you're burning a 10-acre track in the middle of 10,000, that's not impacting nothing. You know, except that 10 acres. But if it's a, but if it's a 10-acre track in the middle of Houston, you know, that's a that's going to impact those species right there because there's no other area around there to form to go to or do whatever. So you got to think about scale. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.